Welcome to our service today. Wherever you are, I'm glad that you chose to sit down, focus, and prepare to worship God with us. A bulletin is available on our website for you to download and follow. On it is an announcement regarding our All Saints Communion Sunday observed on November 7th. I invite you to read that. Today, Sunday, October 17th, is our monthly food drive. Youth will be out front from around 9.45 to 11 to receive your donations. And now a message from our choir director. As we move toward reviving many aspects of our church's in-person participation, the one that I've been missing most of all was our choir. I'm happy to say, however, that we feel like we're in a place now to where we can safely reconvene as this wonderful chancel choir here at Westminster by the Sea Presbyterian. We're gonna start back with rehearsals this Thursday night at seven o'clock, and we'll be meeting right here in the sanctuary, so there's plenty of room to spread out. In addition, we have purchased singers masks which are special masks that allows you to sing and all sorts of wonderful things like breathe instead of having to wear conventional masks that hug your face rather closely these are specially con constructed for that reason we will wear them we will not wear them we will see how it goes basically to make sure that everybody feels safe and comfortable about what we're doing as we once again return to glorifying god in our anthems and in our singing. Thank you. Now our service continues. I hope you have a bulletin with which you can join in the call to worship and the other parts of worship. Beloved, let us love one another. We love because God first loved us. Let us worship God.
we are and what we value pulls us away from the Lord. Honest prayer puts us back in touch, and confession sets us again on the right path. Standing in need of prayer, we can begin with today's corporate confession. Sometimes, Sometimes we, we get, get distracted, distracted like Martha. We get distracted in our routines that keep us from listening for your guidance while you read our Bibles. Sometimes, however, we behave like Mary. We devote our time to listening to you to the exclusion of anything else, forgetting us to pull our own weight. God of balance, help us. Forgive us when we cannot discern when to be workers and when to be listeners. In your mercy, dismiss our worries and melt our judgments so we can offer the best parts of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord is patient and kind. He knows us as we are and still loves us. He is always willing to forgive and through the Holy Spirit is always working with us that we might live in the image of God. Jesus Christ is our Lord, and in him we always have hope. With joy we sing our praises. to you like it happened to me when I was growing up. I would come into the house all excited to tell my mom something and I could hear that she was in the kitchen and so I'd come in and start uh, just telling her with great excitement something that has just happened and she would say to me, Jeffrey, can't you see I'm busy cooking? I can't listen to you right now because I'm preparing dinner. Can we talk about this later? And so the thing that I wanted to tell her, I couldn't tell her because she was focusing on preparing dinner. But later in the evening, when it was time for my bed, she was a great listener as she was tucking me in and she would say, now tell me what you wanted to tell me. And she was listening so carefully Sometimes we have to pick the time and place when we talk to our parents or someone else, maybe even a teacher. But there's a story in the Bible about a woman that was busy pre pre preparing food. Her name was Martha and her sister Mary was busy just listening to Jesus. And they too learned that there's a time and a place for everything. Remember that when you have something exciting to tell someone or a question to ask someone. Let us pray. Jesus, certainly you are glad to have a meal being prepared for you, and yet you also praise the one who sat and listened to you. Help us to figure out what is the right time and what is the right activity for us to be part of your family. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we hear God's word from Scripture and in sermon, let us pray to the Holy Spirit for help. Holy Spirit, we love to hear the biblical stories. We need our minds prepared and our hearts open so these old, old stories speak to us as God's word for our lives in this day. Inspire us with an eagerness to hear and believe and give us the desire to be transformed in life and faith. Amen. The first lesson today is from 1 Kings 17, 
8 through 16. It is helpful, I think, to know what happens right before this story. King Ahab has come to the throne in Israel. He is the next in a long line of very bad kings. He's the guy who married Jezebel, who you might remember. Because of that, God has ordered his prophet Elijah to declare that there will be a drought. And this is what happens soon after the rains stop. The word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, Go now to Seraphith, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a woman there to feed you. So he set out and went to Seraphith. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar, and a little oil in a jug, and I am now gathering a couple of sticks, so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and then die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as I have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord our God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be empty, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as he and her household, ate for many days. The jar of the meal was not empty, neither did the jug of oil fail, because it was according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken through Elijah. <laughs>
second lesson comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work for myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this month, when our lessons have helped remind us how to express our welcome and our hospitality to others, technologist Linda Stone has perfectly described the internet age in which we live. She calls it the age of continuous partial attention. As I'm driving home to church each day, I have always seen at least one person texting and driving. Marianne has broken me of that habit, which I did have. Back before the pandemic, when we used to go to restaurants for dinner, even she and I were guilty of bringing our phones into the restaurants and checking them. And when our grandchildren were with us, they would be on an iPad looking at games. Sometimes there would be games at the restaurants that you would just put $1.99 in and they would play those. So the distractions were all around. New York Times author Thomas Friedman once wrote about being driven by cab from Charles de Gaulle Airport to Paris. During the one hour trip, he and the driver had done six different things. The driver had driven the cab, talked on his cell phone, and watched a video, which Friedman <laughs> said was a little nerve wracking. And Friedman had been riding, working on a column on his laptop, and listening to his iPod. Said Friedman, there was only one thing we never did, talk with each other. Some people believe that they can easily do two things at once. They may believe that, but John Medina, author of Brain Rules, says what actually happens is that our brain rapidly shifts attention from one thing to another, not doing either task as well as a concentrated effort. There will be some among you who will disagree with that claim from Medina, who is a developmental molecular biologist and research consultant. You'll say you can pay attention to doing two things at once. If one activity is supposed to be listening to the one talking to you, you will seem distracted. So, so many people want someone to hear their stories, listen to their issues, and acknowledge their pain. A professor at a seminar about active listening brought in an advertisement from a newspaper. The ad said, for $50, I will listen to you in person for one hour without interruption or comment. His phone rang off the hook as he made appointments just to listen. People are hungry to have people pay attention to their thoughts, their concerns, their needs. So today we zip back to a town called Bethany outside of Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. No internet, no electronics, but the issues regarding human nature were still there. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is only one mention of Mary and Martha, and this is it. In John's Gospel, we learn that Mary and Martha had a brother named Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. 
Jesus and his friends would find uh, feel apparently welcomed there in Bethany and stop there instead of going into Jerusalem where they might be discovered. Luke says Jesus entered a certain village, unquote, but we know it was Bethany. We also notice that it was Martha who welcomed him into their home. Pay attention to what she does to show hospitality. Mary and Martha were sisters, and so they were both hosting Jesus, a friend, but out of honor, they called him Lord. Martha is being the consummate hostess, and her sister is just sitting at Jesus' feet. I have seen this scenario before. Maybe you have too. My grandmother's husband died when my father was just four years old, so her sister, a single school teacher, came with, to live with her to help rear, as they call it in Georgia, my father and his brother. After my father was grown and married and had four children with my mother, we would travel in the summer times to visit them. My grandmother was the Martha. She did a lot to prepare the house, and she always cooked dinner, usually something like our favorite, fried chicken in her black skillet. And what did her sister do during this whole time? She was sitting with us on the ground most of the time, teaching us games, telling us stories, and asking about our lives. She was a great listener but she got in trouble with her sister for not helping. In that scenario, we actually grew closer to her because she listened to us so well. To this day, we remember the games she taught us, and I have passed some of them on to my grandsons. She was not lazy. She loved to fish and to read, but she wanted a relationship with us. Apparently, Jesus needed a listener that day. Certainly the hospitality that Martha offered was appreciated and needed, but could it be that something else was on our Lord's mind that he wanted to share? Immediately after his visit, he taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, and he denounced Pharisees. Unlike most of us, he knew that his time on earth was short. As I visited people in hospice settings, things are different in that world. In hospice settings, a person has been told his or her time on earth is a shorter timeline than usual, a few days, a few weeks, or a few months. When people are in that situation, unless they are medicated and have trouble speaking, they want to tell their family and friends things that are important to them, and they need people to listen. One time when my other grandmother, my mother's mother, was still healthy, she brought my sister and me into their living room. She was in her chair, and we were both sitting cross-legged on the ground, and she said, I would be so pleased if you would both pick out things that I have, maybe pieces of furniture, that you would enjoy after I'm gone. And we both said at the same time, don't talk like that. And she said, no, I mean it. It would give me a lot of joy to know something that um, I have would bring you happiness. So she wanted listeners too. I pointed to a bookcase I always loved. And my sister pointed to another piece of furniture. She says, get a piece of paper, write your name on it, and tape it on the bottom. My sister did that and I did that. And now I have the bookcase and I treasure it. And my grandmother got joy and peace by having us sit at her feet, listen to her, and answer her question. My grandmother could absolutely be a Martha. She was a wonderful hostess. But that day, at that particular time, 
she needed my sister and me to be like Mary. Jesus, that particular day, needed a friend more than a hostess. Some days we need that. Some days we are just hungry to say things that matter. Things like telling someone that you love them. Things like the news you just got from a doctor's visit. Things like expressing fear over our recent medical diagnosis. Sometimes we need another person to listen without the distraction of a phone. And sometimes we want a person to be totally present when unexpectedly tears of disappointment or tears of discouragement start to flow. Jesus once said, we do not live by bread alone. On that particular day, it was not a growling stomach that was Jesus' focus. It was sharing something pressing with his friends. And it turned into a conversation that reminds me of the words from Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. Fixing the food was the normal thing for women in the Bible to do to welcome guests. But on that particular day, Jesus wanted to talk more than he wanted to eat. Every other day, Martha was doing the expected and appreciated thing. But there are times to just sit at someone's feet and hear the other person's hopes about where beloved pieces of furniture would go when she was gone. Or sit next to nieces and nephews, listening carefully to them, hearing about their lives, telling them, teaching them games, or telling them uh, stories while the aroma of fried chicken was filling the living room. How are your listening skills? People so value being heard by someone they cherish and appreciate. And after a dreadful diagnosis, or after being bullied or teased at school, or after their joyous or unfortunate news to share about a pregnancy, people need to listen. People need others to listen without judgment to gently offer a willingness to be with them. The one who is sick might need someone to lean on, or someone who is very ill might need a special friend or spouse to take the journey with them to the valley of the shadow of death. Dishes can wait when someone just needs good listeners. I'm grateful for, for when people in my life have been like Martha, taking care of tasks. I can be like Martha most of my days too. Sometimes I would rather do dishes than visit. But some days I can tell that someone is troubled and then I can become like Mary, listening fully listening, and if appropriate, deciding together how to support the other person. One final thought. The Reverend Cynthia Jarvis was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Chestnut Hill, Pennsylvania, where I asked permission to preside over the wedding of our son, Chris, and his wife to his wife, Amanda. Cynthia Jarvis has written about this pal passage and made an analogy to the church life that I think is worth sharing. Here's what she wrote. A church that has been led to be, quote, worried and distracted by many things inevitably will be a community that dwells in the shallows of frantic potlucks, anxious stewardship campaigns, and events designed simply to perpetuate the institution. Decisions will be made in meetings without a hint of God's reign. Food and drink will appear at table with, without Christ being recognized in the breaking of the bread. I recognize myself in that description, worried and distracted by many things. But as I wrote to our congregation members last week, it is time for me to leave the kitchen to sit at the feet of our Lord and listen again. 
To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. The time for moving through the valley unto the hills from whence cometh our help is now. Please join me. Too often, we, come, we can become at odds with one another. We seek your peace in our families, churches, communities, and nation. By your Spirit, help us to tone down our rhetoric and increase in gentleness and kindness 
humility, and love. Inspire us to give each other space to be different, to acknowledge their special gifts, and to affirm the ways they enrich our lives. Be with parents and children. Growing into adulthood is a rough road. Helping children gain independence and find their place is harrowing work. Bring to parents the right mix of love and discipline, listening and direction, involvement and allowing freedom. Instill in children personal worth and confidence in themselves, but also the wisdom to ask for help. Remind both parents and children to love one another. We pray for those among us who are struggling with health issue, issues. For some, it is a sharp pain. For others, chronic conditions. For some, it is a new illness. For others, simply the accumulation of years. For some, it is not knowing and needing a solid diagnosis. For others, it is the agony of treatment and the loss of strength. For some, it is getting to so many appointments, but for others, it is the isolation that sickness causes. Bring healing that overcomes illness. Make your presence known to those who are suffering. Be near to those who lie awake long hours in the night. Help those who wait, sustain their patience, and keep them filled with hope. Grant wisdom to physicians for determining what is happening and what will help. We give thanks for all caregivers who serve in love and ask that you sustain all who care for the sick and the dying, for they have such a necessary but demanding and daunting task. Dear Lord, tragedies are ongoing and everywhere, it seems. We pray for families grieving their murdered loved ones. Comfort them as only you can. We pray for police in constant danger. Be their guard and guardian. We pray for peoples whose homes are destroyed by fire, wind, and raging water. Bring help to aid them. We pray for people at the end of their rope and desperate for money to pay their bills and food to feed their families. We thank you for all who give them support and as they are able, supply what others need. In addition to these things, we pray now as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Like the widow of Zarephath, God calls us to trust him. Our offerings are acts of trust. We trust that God's blessing will not cease. We trust that there will be enough for others and us. Let us show our thanksgiving for all God has given us and our trust in God's continuing great goodness by making an offering to the Lord.
exhortation. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts you have given us in skill and talent, in opportunity to serve, and in finances. Whether we are giving or receiving, we are blessed to be part of the economy of your kingdom, where there is enough for everyone. May our gifts be used for your glory. Amen. for everything, so choose when you will listen and choose when you will serve. As you go, the love of God uphold you, the Spirit of God empower you through the Son of God who was born, lived, died, and lives again for you. Amen.